Buddha started training his son, Rahula. The first lesson he gave him was a lesson in truthfulness. Which means several things. Being truthful with other people, and being truthful with yourself. about what's actually going on in the mind. And the quality of truthfulness also means once you've made up your mind to do something, you stick with it. You actually do it, in spite of whatever difficulties it involves. All three of these qualities go together. The truthfulness of statements you make, the truthfulness of how you represent yourself to yourself and your willingness to stick with your convictions, in spite of the difficulties they, they may involve, being true to your determinations. All three of these things are absolute rock-solid basic qualities that are needed in the practice of the Dharma. Being a true person is very closely connected with being truthful about what you say and about how you think about yourself. So truth is not just a quality of words, it's a quality of the person. Because the big problem in our lives is the ignorance that leads to suffering. And a lot of that ignorance is willed. It's not simply a matter of not knowing, it's not wanting to know. This is why the Buddha put ignorance and craving together as the causes of suffering. There are certain things we don't like to admit to ourselves. We see a, an unskillful mind state coming up and we tend to dress it up. Say, well, maybe it's not so bad after all. Or well, we deny that we actually feel it. Of course, that makes it difficult to understand why it's there to begin with. This is why the Buddha said, when you look at things arising and passing away, that's not enough to gain insight into them. You also have to ask yourself, what's the appeal when you're holding on to something that causes suffering? Ask yourself, what's the appeal? Why do I like this? We may not even admit to ourselves that we like it, and that gets in the way of any kind of understanding. So you have to be willing to look at your mind and say, yeah, there are a lot of unskillful things going on in here. When they talk about acceptance in the practice, this is what they mean, accepting that there are unskillful sides to the mind, unskillful members of the committee. But it turns out you can't just push them away or pretend they're not there. You have to understand where they're coming from. And sometimes you can do the understanding in the abstract, but a lot of times you don't understand it until that committee member is really insistent, screaming at you. You want this, you hate that. And so you've got to learn how to ask the committee member, okay, why? Right then and there. Don't wait until afterwards to think about it more in the abstract, because by that time the committee member has come up with a new reason, and different parts of the mind will have embroidered a new screen behind which that committee member can hide. So when there's a particularly strong reaction in the mind, you've got to react strongly back the other way and say, why? What's the reason? I'm not going to act on anything until I hear a good reason. And many times this committee member will have been used to getting its way just by being very forceful, very strong, and you give in. But you have to be strong in response. Say, nope, I'm not going to give in until I hear a good reason. And you may actually hear some reasons coming out of it at that point. But again, they may not be the true reasons. You have to be very skeptical about these reasons. This is really why you're attached. 
and see what comes up, what answer appears in the mind. And as I said, wait until you hear a really good one before you're willing to act on that committee member. And if you're strong enough to resist it, you'll find that its strength will begin to wane. There's that great picture that was in a meditation manual I saw one time of a tiger, and the tiger's face was extremely large and very realistic. It was drawn into all the little details, all the little hairs on the face, the whiskers. But the body of the tiger was paper, like origami. In other words, many times these feelings come on very strong, and you give in because they're so strong. No, you don't realize that the strength lasts only for a little while. If you can wait and be patient, the strength will go away. Then you can look at it more calmly. And see what it is that the mind's been feeding on. This image of feeding is one that the Buddha uses throughout his teachings. It was common in the time of India. You might even say that Buddha's philosophy was about the question, how do we know what's good to eat? It started with the Vedas. Those were rituals for feeding your relatives in heaven, or storing up food for yourself. So that when you die, you'll have a store of food in heaven as well. The concept being that you need to feed in order to stay alive. Well, it's not just physical feeding, the Buddha realized. That there's a mental feeling that goes on as well. He took that image into the mind. There are sensations that we feed on. There are states of awareness we feed on, consciousness we feed on. And there are also mental intentions. And these are the important ones. What's your intention? What do you want out of a situation, and why does that particular desire appeal to you? And learn to look at it with a jaundiced eye. We don't like to think that we have unskillful emotions, unskillful ideas. But if we didn't have them, we wouldn't suffer. And so it's the honesty that can see through. Okay, maybe I'd like to think that my mind is pure and okay, but wait a minute, there are these problems. Maybe there is something wrong and there's something unskillful. And the fortunate thing about it is if you really open the mind to the light of day, you begin to see that the unskillful motives really don't make any sense. The reason they have power is because they hide, and when they hide they seem to be bigger than they are. So this is why the Buddha said, when talking about how he teaches, he says, let a person come who is honest and observant, and I will teach that person the Dharma. Honest both in the sense of being truthful with him or herself, being truthful with people around him or her, and observant in really looking into the mind. seeing what it is that the mind's been feeding on, and how that feeding is unskillful. You're looking both for the allure of whatever attachment you have, and also the drawbacks. And there's really no other guarantee that we have. After all, the Buddha isn't sitting here right now to tell you yes or no. You look at the texts, how do we know that the texts were accurately handed down? With the different techniques that are out there that are guaranteeing you if you complete our technique, there you are, awakened. Well, how do you know that that's true? Our only guarantee is our own honesty. And if we lack honesty, there's no safety at all. 